Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Jacob's Engineering's Perspective on IO, IoT OT Security, sponsored by CyberX. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Heather Wishart Smith, Raja Kadayala, Adi Karasik, Robert Brokamp, and Phil Naray. Phil will be moderating today's webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Phil. Thank you, Carol, and welcome everyone to the webcast today. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of content to uh, present today from the folks at Jacobs Engineering, and I'm going to start with a brief intro to set the stage. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the challenges around securing IoT and OT environments. Uh, Jacobs is then going to talk about various domains in which they're involved, and we're going to wrap up with a slide pointing you to some additional educational resources. So why are we even talking about IoT or OT security? Uh, many organizations are going through initiatives uh, variously called Industry 4.0, digitization, uh, digitalization, but they all relate to the same thing, which is how do we deploy more smart devices into our environments to capture more real-time intelligence and make our operations more productive and efficient. And at least in this survey uh, from Gartner, it was uh, shown that cybersecurity is a key concern uh, for these initiatives. Now, why? Why is that? Well, it turns out that the devices that are being deployed today uh, in IoT, but also many of the legacy OT devices that may have been deployed 15 or 20 years ago are soft targets. Uh, they're embedded devices. They are typically unmanaged, which means they don't support agents. And as a result, they're unseen by the IT organization. Uh, they were designed with primary design objectives being time to market and low cost rather than security. Uh, they may have weak or default credentials, incorporate vulnerable open source, and uh, often are directly connected to the internet. And according to Gartner, uh, the deployment of these devices will increase the attack surface that you are required to protect by a factor of three uh, compared to the desktops and servers you currently have. And on the right, you see some examples of what I mean when I say IoT and OT, it's everything from smart building devices, uh, devices in logistics and warehousing systems, cameras, building access control, and at the bottom right, what you might call industrial IoT devices, such as sensors, uh, measuring vibration or temperature in applications such as predictive uh, maintenance. Uh, another reason these environments are insecure is if you look at uh, these assessments that CyberX has done, and you can download this report where we analyzed network traffic data from over 1,800 production IoT and ICS networks. Uh, two thirds of them are running unencrypted passwords. Uh, at least a quarter are directly, directly connected to the internet, so that kind of shows that the myth of uh, air gapping has really kind of gone away if it ever existed at all. Um, um, many of them are running unsupported versions of Windows, such as Windows XP, that no longer receives security patches from Microsoft. Uh, we also analyze something we call indicators of threats. If we find scanning activity in a network or malformed headers or specific malware, uh, we characterize that as indicators of threats. You could see there uh, more than a fifth uh, exhibit that. Uh, antivirus for many years was not uh, allowed on many of these traditional OT systems, uh, and we found that at least in two-thirds of the environments, they're either not receiving updates or not running antivirus at all. We're measuring at the, at the network layer, so we can only look for that uh, communication that updates the signatures, but that's what we found. And then finally, uh, more than half are running remote access protocols like RDP, VNC, SSH, which are an essential element of managing these environments remotely. 
And that translates into business trick. I'm going to give you four specific examples of real world attacks. In the first one, uh, we're talking about ransomware. We just saw earlier this week that Honda's factories were shut down due to a ransomware attack. It was a targeted attack, it appears, that came in through RDP and used a specific form of malware called Snake that specifically targets ICS processes and shuts them down. But we also saw a port earlier this year reported by the DHS in the US as having been shut down. And of course, there have been many other examples, such as the Norsk Hydro example last year that caused $70 million in losses. Uh, the Triton attack on a petrochemical facility really woke people up to how these sophisticated attacks uh, can affect safety. Uh, this was an attack called Triton that specifically went after the safety controllers uh, in a petrochemical plant and the malware had been specifically designed to communicate with a certain type of safety controller, Schneider Electric Triconics, install a back door in the controller and shut down the safety controller uh, with the goal of causing safety incidents leading to loss of human life and uh, damage to the facility. Uh, the next two examples are more what I would call IoT related attacks. This is a campaign discovered by Cisco called VPN Filter. It went after vulnerabilities in a wide range of uh, VPN routers. And of course, VPN routers are an ideal uh, target for adversaries because they're connected to the internet on one side and to your corporate network on the other. And in this case, the malware. Uh, was able to perform man-in-the-middle attacks, sniff the packets, and even inject its own traffic to compromise endpoints on the network. Uh, the final example is an example of a campaign that was reported last summer by Microsoft in which the adversary uh, compromised a voice over IP phone uh, that had default credentials. They then installed a back door into the phone and started scanning the network for other uh, devices to compromise and higher value data and assets. So they pivoted from that initial entry point into the corporate network and moved around, which is the classic pattern that we've seen uh, in these types of attacks. Uh, another risk to speci specifically manufacturing organization is th theft of sensitive IP, such as proprietary product designs, manufacturing processes, uh, and in the most recent Verizon DBR came out a couple of weeks ago, they showed that manufacturing is the number one sector being attacked with these type of breaches, with more than one out of four being motivated by cyber espionage, as opposed to ransomware, which is a financially motivated attack. Also, a large proportion of these attacks are from nation states. And you can imagine, uh, you know, many of these domains in the critical infrastructure are being targeted. And a great quote by the Verizon DBIR that it's cheaper and simpler to steal something like a design than to design it yourself. So let's quickly talk about uh, what's happened in the last few months. Of course, with more employees and contractors working remotely, uh, RDP and other remote access methods have become the preferred mechanism for managing and maintaining uh, ICS devices in your factories and, and plants. And so the adversaries are looking for a way to compromise those networks by blending into a sea of legitimate traffic that's already going into those environments. And then two interesting data points. This one uh, showing that RDP is actually the preferred attack vector for ransomware. You might have thought it was phishing, which is the middle curve here, the blue curve. Uh, you might have thought it was zero days or other vulnerabilities, which is the red curve. But actually, RDP is the preferred attack vector. There's a couple reasons for that. Um, weak and default credentials are common on these uh, ports. Uh, you can buy RDP credentials on the dark web for anywhere from $5 to $100. And there are also uh, vulnerabilities in RDP like Deja Blue, uh, Deja View, excuse me, which uh, have been patched by Microsoft, but if you haven't patched those servers, then you're exposed to those vulnerabilities. So there's many ways for the bad guys to get in using RDP. The other interesting stat is this one, which shows that the attacks on RDP rose dramatically around the second week of March, which is around when folks started uh, realizing that this was a bigger deal than we had initially thought. The red curve there is the attacks on the USA. So how can uh, our agentless platform address the risk? I'm going to minimize the sales pitch here, but I did want to let you know 
that it's an agentless platform, uh, passive monitoring, connects to a span port, and uh, performs continuous monitoring to immediately detect unauthorized or suspicious behavior. And rather than relying on static IOCs, uh, which are really ineffective if the adversary is using uh, um, living off the land tactics like RDP, uh, PS Exact, uh, Mimikatz, you really need behavioral analytics to detect that suspicious behavior rather than relying on static IOCs. And our platform is enabled by IoT and OT aware specific behavioral analytics, so algorithms specifically tuned to the deterministic behavior that we find in these environments compared to the non-deterministic behavior you typically find in an IT environment. And it's also being continuously updated from our in-house threat intelligence team called Section 52 that's constantly monitoring IoT and OT uh, specific campaigns, adversaries, and malware. In terms of the other use cases, uh, asset discovery is number one, typically used to easily implement zero trust. If you don't know what you have and what devices are communicating with each other, uh, then it's really hard to implement the right zero trust policies. Uh, risk and vulnerability management, so you can prioritize how to address the risks you have to your crown jewel assets. Since you can't fix everything, you need to know what vulnerabilities you have and what are the top attack vectors that would cause a material impact on your firm. Uh, we talked about the threat monitoring and incident response so that you could quickly know if you have an attack because you won't be able to prevent all compromises. The trick is how do you detect it uh, before they can cause any significant damage? Uh, how do you identify operational issues from this continuous monitoring? And finally, how do you uh, unify the information collected from our platform with the existing IT security tools you have in your stack, uh, Curator, Splunk, uh, ArcSight. Uh, you've built some security operation centers, you've trained your teams, uh, and there's no reason to build a separate SOC to address OT security. And uh, so that's why we've spent a lot of time and energy uh, early on focusing on native integrations, API level, bi-directional integrations with many of the products you already have in your IT security stack. And now I'd like to hand it off to the folks at Jacobs, and in particular, Heather, who's going to talk about um, what Jacobs is doing in this domain. I apologize. I just realized that I was on mute. Thank you so much, Phil. I appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll be joined by my fellow presenters, Raja Kadiala, Adi Karasik, and Bob Brokamp. You could advance the slide, please, Phil. It's not quite working for me. There we go. So at Jacobs, we do feel very strongly about the importance of safety, and so we don't start any of our presentations without a safety moment. And I think everyone here on this uh, webcast is probably well aware of cyber risks and how they can impact us personally. But I ask that you just briefly peruse this list here because there are different people in our lives who would also benefit from this sort of awareness. So whether that's your children and you think of them when it comes to managing social media, but also elderly parents and acquaintances and family members, things like making sure that you help them to understand the risk of opening up and deleting uh, suspicious emails and that sort of thing. Uh, very briefly about Jake. Jacobs, we are looking, um, we really focus on challenging today and reinventing tomorrow. And I think what really helps to set us apart in terms of what we have to offer is, you can take a look here a bit about our history, we're a $13 billion business, but we have two lines of business, people and places solutions that in the past has focused on the more traditional side of the built environment, but which has a very, very robust digital market, which is led by uh, Raja, who will speak in a moment. And also our critical mission solutions line of business that is also very involved, not just in cybersecurity, but in IT, in research and development for clients such as NASA. And what really provides us with a very unique value proposition is the opportunity to bring together the, sometimes in some cases, more traditional design, infrastructure, design, operations, maintenance, construction of more traditional infrastructure with that very high tech piece as well. So what it means is that we're able to better understand our clients' challenges 
sometimes in ways that, you know, that are even more in-depth than they might understand themselves. And these client challenges can be everything from trying to decrease energy usage to um, increasing safety. And we recognize the fact that there are a number of solutions out there, cybersecurity, which we're talking about here, but also IIoT, predictive analytics. And the application of this core set of technologies that are listed here is what allows us to really marry up that domain expertise that we have from having designed, operated, maintained large infrastructure for set over 70 years. We marry that up with that very high tech expertise as well. And so these are the areas that we're really focusing on from a technology perspective to include cybersecurity. So Raj, I'll turn it over to you now. One thing that we've noticed, and, and Phil kind of touched about the uh, touched on this, uh, was uh, that the pandemic is is really accelerating digital adoption. Uh, we're all seeing that. Certainly, uh, uh, what we're doing here in this conference, uh, uh, the the fact that uh, we now have to remote uh, have to work uh, remotely and, and in a more disconnected fashion, those digital technologies and elements are really coming into play. Um, another trend we're seeing, and I'm going to talk about a handful of these projects is we're asking so much more from the built infrastructure uh, than we have in the past. Uh, assets that were typically passive in the past uh, now have to be active. We're asking uh, these infrastructure elements to be to have more performance, to have more efficiency, and also operate at a lower cost. And, and the only way to really do this is to increase the digital footprint footprint within uh, the built infrastructure. So um, you see this uh, uh, effort we're doing uh, in Singapore right now. Uh, Singapore is a little water challenged uh, in terms of uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of drinking water that they have available. So they've actually now begun to recycle their wastewater stream and turn it into drinking water. So uh, there's an effort right now uh, with this Tuos plant uh, where it'll be providing over half the water uh, within the uh, for Singapore for both uh, residential needs and commercial needs uh, by by 2060. Um, the other interesting thing on, on this effort is uh, the amount of energy that we'll be able to recover during this process. Not only are we are we are we saving a valuable resource in in the water, but we're also able to recover. Uh, twice the amount of energy that we have in the past um, uh, through taking the biosolids and the, and the biogas as part of the treatment process and actually they turn it into energy. So this can really only happen with digital technologies and the cyber footprint that's necessary to do this is, is fairly large as Phil was talking about. Um, I'm having a little trouble advancing. If we there, you go. Thank you. Um, we're all familiar with uh, with uh, the importance of the Panama Canal and the fact that it connects uh, 160 different countries uh, uh, through this critical uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, we completed uh, the expansion of the the Panama Canal, and and one of the unique uh, elements uh, of that effort was the fact that uh, the uh, the 60 locks that uh, have been put in place actually recycle 60% of the water used. So we're being really efficient in terms of how we operate uh, this, this facility. Um, the expansion allows uh, much larger cargo to go through and, and cruise ships to go through. And again, that digital element of being able to automatically control that, recycle as much of that valuable resource uh, going forward is another critical element. Next slide. One effort that we are currently undertaking right now is a uh, is a transit uh, effort in Toronto, the Metrolinx project. Uh, so, uh, for those not familiar with Toronto, it actually has the third highest uh, utilization of a transit uh, system within North America. Um, the amount of interconnectivity, the amount of signaling uh, communication that goes on uh, within in this system, uh, both from a station to station and also a rolling stock or, or actual trains itself, is incredibly huge. 
again, that digital footprint is is so important in making sure that we have the proper cyber stance uh, for all that operational technology and IoT uh, is is very important. Next slide. I'm not hearing Raja. Is it? Oh, did we lose him? He, he still looks Sorry, like he's no. here. I'm, I'm still here. Uh, next slide. Raja, we have the uh, semicircles with the um, the yes and no digital transformation okay. goals and challenges. Sorry, I guess that that part's not showing up on my side. I apologize. So mm -hmm. um, the uh, we have surveyed uh, uh, a number of our clients and asked them uh, with regards to digital transformation, what are your goals and challenges? And, and you, you can kind of see their responses. So uh, a high percentage of the folks really want to be able to optimize their operations um, and be able to predict system failure so they can keep uh, their operations going. Uh, challenges, data quality, 100% uh, of the folks uh, felt uh, that data quality was an issue uh, in implementing their digital transformation uh, efforts. Uh, they also felt that they didn't have uh, sufficient uh, talent um, in-house. Then uh, in terms of uh, this concept of, of, of real-time data processing, uh, a large number of them felt uh, that they couldn't actually process the data in real time. While they could actually uh, store and manage it, um, uh, this concept of not being able to, to process the data in real time was real critical. So I'm going to walk through um, uh, a concept uh, that we refer to as the value of now. Next slide. So there's, there's certain information whose value decays exponentially over time, and we really need to perform real-time analytics on that data to provide real-time intelligence. So everything that Phil and Heather were talking about in terms of all that IoT data coming in, it is streaming in, and our ability to actually garner information and intelligence as that uh, data is streaming in is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to walk through an example uh, that we did uh, uh, in New York. Um, go ahead and build out, uh, build out that slide. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing, New Yorkers really don't have any issues about complaining about things. Uh, so we actually streamed that data in, did real-time analytics, and we're able to track um, an issue that was progressing uh, through the, uh, the water distribution network through the calls coming in, doing real-time analytics on that, along with fusing that data with their real-time sensors. So we had the operational uh, technology side of the fence coming together along with all these calls coming together. In this case, it was an algae bloom that had made it through uh, uh, their processes and was actually in the distribution network that was impacting the water, water quality within New York. So you can actually see this animation, which was uh, over about a week and a half's time, where the uh, operational staff could actually see where that algae bloom was. Uh, by utilizing that uh, the, the customer calls coming in along with their sensor, da sensor data so they can actually go out and flush it uh, in real time. So that concept of the value or the value of, of now being able to actually process that information and, and respond to it as it was happening. Next slide. So one thing that we're doing um, is is utilizing digital twins to uh, to actually allow ourselves to provide the proper cyber stance right from the start. So we're actually able to um, to go ahead and do uh, the cyber design um, in the digital realm prior to that facility actually coming online. So we're able to program uh, all the SCADA systems, all the uh, PLCs, industrial systems take a look at the network traffic uh, that's coming through while the facility is actually being built. And by the time that we've already gone ahead and validated everything, um, we're ready to, to, to simply click a deploy button and have everything that we learned in the digital realm apply to that real world facility. And that really is allowing us to have that proper cyber stance from an OT perspective, from an IOT perspective, uh, right from the get go. Now I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Adi and Bob and they're gonna really talk about some of the technical elements that we utilize 
uh, with regards to our design and implementation of these systems. Thank you, Raja. So, uh, w w Jacob is a big organization, and we have the unique opportunity to capture multiple markets and multiple type of customers. And uh, the graphics in this particular slide illustrates the two different offerings that we do. The right in blue representing all the conventional IT cybersecurity and cybersecurity related services that Jacobs performs. And the, the, the graph on the left, it, it presents the stuff that we do on the operational technology or industrial control system side. Uh, let me see if I have the control. It's, there we go. Uh, in um, in terms of the operational technology services and how we are structured, uh, these are some of the services, and I'm not going to go through the bullets. It's uh, it would be counterproductive. However, what I would like to draw everybody's attention because uh, Jacobs services so many different clients and provides so many wide uh, selection of services and offerings. The area in which we provide operational technology to include security services for operational technology systems and uh, IoT devices is in water sector, transportation, environmental, advanced facilities, built environment, power and mining. Because the variety of clients that we support is so large, we have to have different solutions, technologies and techniques, how to approach and deal with those. And I will talk about some of those during the, these slides and then Bob will focus on the advanced facilities primarily on the life sciences portion. Next slide, please. So what is the operational technology? Operational technology in the, in the shortest uh, description would be the IT services for the operational technology networks. While IT and IT cybersecurity have a goal of protecting your data, which confidentiality becomes your primary concern, on the production side and the operational technologist side, we're protecting the physical things and physical processes. Next slide, please. So here is a good illustration that I believe shows the uh, relevance of operational technology and operational technology cybersecurity surface, uh, surface in terms of the abstract value. Uh, if you look at the glacier on the, on the left, the, the part below the surface that is less visible, but in frequently much bigger in size, represents all of those OT elements that can be attacked. The issue that we have in addition in the production environments is that the industrial network progression has happened suddenly. And while IT, conventional IT systems had generations of involvement, that happened very quick on the operational technology side. And in normal clients, we see a disparity where IT systems are better organized, have better policies, procedures in place. We're dealing with older equipment on the OT side. We're dealing with lack of uh, procedures, lack of pr uh, strategy, and uh, requirements for the new technologies does not stop on IT side. So that is the additional challenge. There are a lot of threats in this particular environment, from nation states to the rogue groups, and um, uh, instead of focusing on these that are presented on your screen, I'm going to bring up uh, a situation with the public utility in the United States where we had a recent infiltration of a foreign terrorist element who was collecting important information about a water distribution system in that particular region. So these uh, facilities are really becoming threats of uh, on security both digitally and physically. Next slide, please. So is it really a uh, big and important threat ha being hacked or losing control of the facilities? So uh, j I'll just highlight a couple of points in yellow that I will talk about. Average security breach on a digital side takes about four to six months to be detected. On the IoT side of things, just in 2017, the attacks were up by 600%. Over about a third of all organizations have experienced different type of cyber attacks on their operational infrastructure. And my minor portion of the global organization believe that they're properly equipped and able to handle a complex cyber attack. The other thing that is important is 65% of all companies of over 500 employees have, never changed, uh, have employees that never changed their passwords. Now, again, on IT side, policies sometimes regulate that, but on OT side, a lot of policies are still lacking and we're dealing with default or no passwords at all. Finally, we mentioned ransomware a little bit ago, Phil did, and uh, 
interesting is that the growth of ransomware attacks is 350% annually, and every 13 seconds a new business falls a victim to ransomware attack. Next slide, please. So what does that really mean? There is, uh, there is additional threat that involves uh, and in, in fact, uh, affects the digital systems, both in IT and OT environment. And no, uh, traditionally the industries had the air gap system or uh, obscurity systems that were not really uh, good. And the reason they're not good, they don't address one fundamental issue that we have, which is the insider threat issue. The example here is a Marucci wastewater facility where a disgruntled employee with valid credentials has released 750,000 gallons of untreated sewage uh, because of him being disgruntled. There is no system or policy that can prevent that quickly using the traditional air gap or obscurity methods. Next slide. So in short, the biggest challenge that we see on overall ICS cybersecurity side is initial resistance of a clients and facilities to re actually acknowledge we need help in this. Uh, there, there are a lot of free resources. There are a lot of existing resources, solutions, and technologies that could be leveraged and utilized. But it starts with the require, with the realization, hey, we need help on this. Next slide. There are plenty of industry guidelines. Everybody refers always to Nest. It's not much different, maybe a little bit different guidelines, but it's not much different from the IT side of the house. However, knowing where the resources are and how to properly leverage them is very important. And a lot of uh, industrial clients fail short because they can dedicate time or resources to do the research or to do the full implementation and study of available resources. Next slide. Another thing important about the protecting organizations is it's very easy to explain to organization the concept of safety and that everybody plays a very important pivot key role about safety culture in their organization. At the same time, the same applies to digital safety and cybersecurity. Everybody in the organization should have a role in promoting cybersecurity, in promoting cybersecurity awareness, in promoting requirements, training, and, and resiliency that that organization have in contemporary environment. Next slide. What are the priorities for a variety of ICS cybersecurity programs? The priorities are listed in this wheel, but the reason that, uh, we chose to present them in a wheel is not uh, graphics. It's because I can't tell you which one is more important than the other. And common mistake is to dedicate all of your resources and personnel to chase one of the parts of this wheel while the others are uncovered. So the proper approach is you are as the business owners, as the uh, as the facilitator, as a protector of an organization responsible for coverage on all of these. Next slide. Uh, so. A lot of times they talk about ICS, uh, they talk about the cybersecurity and they say, hey, it's new, we, you know, but we use very old concept to defend facilities. It's the same concept that's used on informational technology side of the house. And that, that's defense in depth. And that's the technology you or strategy used from middle ages. And that's why the castles were built the way they were built to create multiple obstacles for an attacker in, in situation when they needed to defend themselves. So you have a moat as a defense element, you have the tower with the archers, you have a courtyard that can, uh, if they breach the wall where you can encounter the attackers and so forth. And you keep adding layer after layer of defense. And that's how the original military doctrine for defense uh, started in those days. Now, compare, let's compare that for a second with what, uh, oh, sorry, uh, what, uh, what, does, what does that look in a cybersecurity uh, sense? So we're not protecting the, the courtyard, we're not protecting the moat, we're protecting the device and then the application, computer, network, physical, uh, and then finally policies and procedures as the element. And the second graphic corresponds to what is the prevailing result of protecting that and how do we do that? So this correlation and understanding is not a very complicated concept, but it's not anything new. This has been around for hundreds of years. 
Another important thing here is uh, we hear from our clients that it's very difficult to grasp the new generation concepts of having the demilitarized zone where uh, and set while segregating the business and operational networks. Again, another new, relatively old concept. This concept actually is rooted from the buildup of the ancient city of Babylon. Ancient city of Babylon had two sets of walls and they would allow traders to come in and all the interaction with the outside trade organizations would happen between the two walls, but they would actually not let the, the foreigners inside the city. This is the same principle we're using in contemporary industrial control systems. So is it enough if we just say we're following all these principles? It's really not because there are organizations that have a relatively robust and solid programs and systems in place. However, due to the simple negligence, like a contractor on site plugging their computer into their network to show them a new PowerPoint and carrying uh, a malware on a computer can create an environment where the facility can be out of commission for minutes, days, hours, depending on a situation. This is the example from a uh, Davis Best nuclear power plant. So how do we do this? What we recommend typically is a five-step process. First, to build a proactive security model and then adopt all standardized countermeasures for industrial control systems for our clients. Keeping abreast of all the security standards that are applicable to that type of environment and use the all available industrial tools and services. And finally, to never stop but continue building a ro robust in industrial control system cybersecurity program. This is a marathon, this is not a sprint, and it's a never ending process that keeps going on. Another thing that we noticed is uh, there are a lot of uh, clients who purchase a variety of uh, solutions, and those are all semi solutions that maybe or maybe do, uh, maybe integrated together or not. But with a variety of contractors integrating different type of solutions, that creates a whole new set layer of vulnerabilities where those products do or do not work well together. So uh, suggestion is have a centralized integrated solution, a centralized integrator who can, up, instead of providing you just a one slice of a service, build the whole overall encompassing solution because that's the only way you uh, one can keep a situation in check. We mentioned a little bit about uh, a little bit ago the the current environment in which we live in and we live and operate and uh, virtually and in that situation uh, typically in industrial environments uh, you will not see a whole lot of policies for remote access because traditionally it's not a part of that environment. However, now we're getting into a new set of problems with non availability of personnel which can cause a requirement to have remote access management. So I'm not advocating pro or against it. I'm just saying that now we have a problem that we need to solve where we are forced to provide external access to people. Also, every organization should have a proper disaster recovery program. These plans are not uh, very complicated to create. And it again, it alludes to the another layer of policies, plans and procedures that is typically lacking on the operational technology side. So how do we do this as Jacobs? So Jacobs uh, uses several uh, laboratories in which uh, technology laboratories in which we deploy our partner technologies. And based on those partner technologies, we allow our clients to come in and build the custom solutions for them. Not only that we leverage the, uh, uh, the technologies in our labs, we also market and work and do the research. You know, with CyberX, we have done a lot of work together both for our external clients and internally for internal Jacobs clients. We, you know, we just published a, a new paper on security of water systems with Cisco. So we, I will talk a few minutes later about some of the projects that we did together with other companies. So we do have ability to leverage the best of the best and give customer the final choice and say, hey, this is how, what we can offer and we can pick and choose and uh, we will create the best solution suitable for that particular client. 
In short, this is the process that we operate on. We assess the situation for first, then we move into securing the facility, then we create a design that has to include policies, plans, procedures, and has to be relevant to the, that particular geographic area incident command doctrine based on our lessons from COVID-19. Uh, we build a solution. We improve the existing technology and modify the policy plans and procedures to reflect the new reality. And then it's all about optimizing and creating resiliency and efficiency. We have a whole line of uh, Jacob's uh, abilities to provide monitoring of the solutions through our managed services program. And finally, we advise our client when the equipment or services become reach the point of the end of life and have to be changed or upgraded. Probably the key staple project we did this year was the cybersecurity for uh, uh, water supply systems for the Miami Super Bowl. We teamed up with CyberX, Cisco, uh, Silence, uh, and uh, Garland, and uh, Enclave, and delivered a, uh, a solution that operated that water plant throughout the Super Bowl. The fact that nobody has heard about any particular incidents during the Super Bowl tells me that we did a pretty good job. Uh, another good example is Oklahoma City, City of Oklahoma City, who is one of our major clients. And uh, here we've learned about the discrepancies and little differences in levels of IT and OT organization and bringing this convergence of IT and OT in the public infrastructure. And that was a big lesson learned from us. And uh, being a company that can perform on both sides of the fence, this was a very useful experience. Another example where we leveraged a lot of our partner technologies, uh, currently working here with CyberX, the uh, City of Rio Rancho water supply system. The uh, It's a very complex uh, design and we're trying to uh, mo modernize the way this plant is used. And so far we have uh, had the great results. And last slide I'm going to talk about is the city of Roseville in California. And the reason I'm bringing this as a solution uh, and as a good past performance is we received kudos from the Department of Homeland Security for a cybersecurity design for the industrial control systems that are used within this particular department. And at this point, I'm going to turn it to Bob. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Need to go back to presentation mode so I can advance slides. Awesome. All right, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and I'd like to take a minute here to uh, talk about cybersecurity in the life science industries. I think um, my presentation is going to touch on and recap a lot of the concepts that we've talked through from a Jacobs perspective, the digital platforms and, and cybersecurity. Um, certainly one of the things that uh, I've taken away from the life science industries, I'm gonna talk about uh, parallels to the concepts of computer system validation. Um, show my age, those, this concept became uh, to the market in the late 80s, actually, where the FDA introduced the, the requirement for validation of computer systems. Those are all based on IEEE software engineering standards, clearly IT standards, and now we were trying to apply them in a, at an OT level to control systems in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. Um, Living through that, uh, I can tell you what was premier uh, in the delivery of those concepts was the domain knowledge of the control systems folks that uh, I worked with side by side with the validation folks and folks who knew that IT. So it's bringing together those solutions, merging the technology with the domain experience. And it's, it's true today as we look at some of these characteristics of the life sciences industries and cybersecurity. Um, the regulations certainly drive a highly regulated industry, uh, has expanded the target surface that we talked about. Um, and uh, the hackers and threat actors think I uh, recognize the highly valuable IP data there that's present when we're talking about uh, manufacturing operations data or electronic batch records, manufacturing records. Um, 
One other point I'll make is that uh, as we already made the point in the nuclear industry, the, uh, the slow movement to upgrade the systems due to the validation uh, and the extra cost in validating those systems kind of makes them slow to update. Next slide, please. Realize I don't have that control. So life sciences, industry, regulations, and cybersecurity, I touched on this. Um, there are no direct regulations for the manufacture of drug product. The FDA has posted regulations on medical devices, uh, and there's been some cyber instances around medical devices. The premier regulations that guide uh, the manufacturer I've listed here, the one I brought to your attention uh, is the fourth bullet down, the good automated manufacturing practices. Um, and as I mentioned, all of these above, all of these embody the risk-based quality systems approach, which is the same approach you see in NIST 82 and uh, IEC 62-443 standards that uh, we apply in these industries. Next slide. So well, there you go. In uh, we talk about the uh, the level of regulation. This is kind of a eye chart. I understand, but I want to point out the fact that um, the life science industries for years uh, have been driven to a high level of uh, vertical integration through the supply chain. So connecting the unit operations, the packaging systems, with the electronic batch records uh, systems, with the historian. Um, and so that there is that large attack system. Uh, there's the, the regulations also call for us to uh, put its systems in place that protect the intellectual property uh, as well as the actual audit trails of the manufacturer. So next slide. Taking a really closer look at these uh, elements in uh, from cybersecurity alongside of the, the computer system validation, we can see across the defense in depth model that Adi shared with us, uh, the need for physical security. Both are present in each of these regulations and standards that we apply, locking up your devices, locking up your computer rooms, your server rooms, protecting ports, et cetera. Uh, of note is authentication and authorization. So if you look at the IEC 62443-3 model uh, that represents multiple security layers that uh, can be placed across systems, specifically, and authentication and identification. Uh, level four is uh, the level that we've put in place for years in manufacturing execution systems. And the, what I point to there is the fact that the need for multi-factor authentication across all users, that's a, that's a characteristic of manufacturing execution systems. Similarly, in, in use control, where at level four requires dual signatures or two people to sign off on critical operations parameters within systems. The integrated approach uh, on the right-hand side, what I'm showing you is a classical V model uh, that's used in the life sciences industries. And when we're dealing with um, building and delivering new projects, new systems, um, what, we, what we understand is that cybersecurity is an integral part of delivering operational technology solutions. So from the beginning, from our requirements, specifications, to our, our vendors who are delivering automated packages, to uh, systems integrators, to owners who assemble the networks and the systems, the, the requirements for at the top level that drive down through the detailed design and the testing and uh, delivery are all critical to uh, the systems approach. Uh, one more back. So a typical uh, application here, um, the zoning conduit model. 
in uh, IEC 62443. You can see, again, I apologize, the eye chart, but zoning off uh, physical systems, physical security systems, laboratory systems, building management systems, our material handling systems, as well as our core production systems are all typical in a life science industries approach. In the middle on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the implementation of a DMZ zone and the application of the automation servers uh, at level three and at level 3.5 uh, implementation of your threat monitoring as well as other information sharing systems connected to uh, zone four or, or the uh, IT environment. This is a uh, classical solutions that we've been rolling out and, and it's, uh, it's not an air gap system and, and it hasn't been for years in the industry. Uh, so we face these challenges and um, these have grown even more complex with the advent of new technology being applied. Uh, I guess that'd be the, the message. I'd, I'll leave it there and uh, we'll turn over to user questions. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Bob, Heather, Raja, Adi for your great presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, on this slide, I'll show you some uh, additional resources that you can access on the CyberX website. In the uh, resources page, uh, you'll see that we've been running a series of roundtables with CISOs and other security experts from companies in various industries. Uh, Baker Hughes is in oil and gas. One Gas is an energy utility. Vector is an energy utility in New Zealand. Mundi Pharma, Donny Energy, Ports of Auckland in the transportation sector. And we've uh, been asking them some interesting questions like how do you bring IT and OT teams together to work better with each other uh, and to overcome some of that traditional uh, us versus them mentality that's been around for a while. And so those are all posted on our website along with the transcript. So if you don't feel like listening to the whole thing, the next time you're out walking your dog, uh, you can actually read the transcripts. And there's some interesting insights there about the value of communication between IT and OT teams and around unifying around common objectives. Since everybody cares about safety, uh, everybody cares about keeping your plants running. Uh, so there's some common objectives there that IT and OT teams can uh, get together around. Uh, there's also some uh, resources you can download on the MITRE attack for ICS matrix. It's a new framework that MITRE organization released a few months ago uh, that looks at the uh, intrusion kill chain along various dimensions. Um, and if you're new to ICS security, there's uh, two great chapters from Hacking ICS Exposed that uh, explains uh, something about the, how ICS is different than OT. Um, I'm going to take a look at the questions here to see if there's any we haven't answered. If there's anything else, uh, Heather or Adi or Raja or Robert, that you want to talk about uh, while we're uh, wrapping up the uh, webinar, please uh, speak up. Okay. Um, I don't have anything yet to add other than thank you so much for the opportunity for us to present, and thanks to everyone who's attended. Thank you, Heather. I see a question here. What kind of defensive solutions are used to detect rogue IoT and OT devices? We find in our client base that that is the, the very first thing they, that uh, folks usually want to set up as an alert. Show me whenever a new or unauthorized device connects to my OT network. And that could be everything from a contractor plugging their laptop directly into the network. We saw a couple years ago, a year ago, that uh, Duke Energy received a massive fine from the NERC regulators. Um, and one of the violations was that folks were plugging their laptops directly into the control network. Obviously, every organization has a policy that says that you shouldn't do that. But if you're not monitoring your network, it's really difficult to enforce that policy. And so uh, we often get that question. It could be a contractor. It could be an employee could be a malicious insider. We, you never really know, but you want to know when someone's plugging a new device into that network and so you can quickly figure out uh, should we block it, uh, keep it off, use a NAC solution or um, 
firewall to get that device off the network. The other thing that we've seen, however, is that clients are using SOAR solutions, security orchestration and automated response solutions, to automatically block malicious uh, endpoints on the network. So here we're talking not just about detection, which is obviously really important, but also prevention, if you're thinking of the NIST model. Uh, they call it protection on the in the NIST model. But the idea is that whenever you see something that's obviously malicious, like a device scanning your network, which could be indicative of cyber reconnaissance, or uh, obviously a device infected with known malware, like not Petya or Eternal Blue, uh, or um, a device that is uh, sending out malformed traffic or abusing an industrial protocol in some way. These are all examples of uh, incidents that the CyberX platform will detect, and what our clients are doing is connecting those alerts directly through API level interfaces to their firewalls and other prevention solutions, so they can not only quickly detect that something is going on that shouldn't be, they can actually block it. Yeah, Phil, if I can add, uh, the, the, the endpoint detection uh, and the insertion of a new device is important. Along that uh, side of the fence, also, uh, understanding uh, if there is some uh, software um, that was installed uh, on uh, an existing endpoint uh, that is uh, creating uh, malicious traffic. So it, it extends uh, kind of what you were talking about and the, the ability to, to be able to monitor and then also have automation to, to kind of shut some of that traffic down, which uh, could be as detrimental as having a, a new piece of hardware inserted in there. Yeah, it's a great point, and uh, CyberX is participating with NIST in a new project uh, that they are launching to test various solutions in their labs and look for, for example, application whitelisting. Now, you think of application whitelisting, obviously, as something you could put on a Windows endpoint uh, to prevent unauthorized software from being installed, but you also need to monitor at the network layer. Um, certainly, you can't detect unauthorized applications running on embedded devices with agents, so you need uh, a network layer solution. And that's why uh, our solution can sometimes be thought of as a network detection and response solution, NDR, uh, that's very complementary to endpoint detection and response solutions, EDR. Well, we're, we've got to the top of the hour. I want to thank uh, my co-panelists for their great presentations and comments, and hand it back to Carol. Thank you. and. Uh, have a great day. All right. Thank you so much, Phil, Audi, Robert, Raja, and Heather for your great presentation. And to Cyber CyberX for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care. And we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.